I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about how we've been trying to face the challenge of uh, identifying and treating hepatitis C amongst prisoners in Australia. My disclosures are there. So I'm going to give you just a touch of background in case you're not immediately familiar with the prisons as, as an entity and prisoners as a population and how that intersects with the issue of hepatitis C. Uh, Margaret's done a pretty good job in setting the scene for me, talking to you about hepatitis C in Australia. So I'm just uh, briefly reiterate one or two elements. I'm going to mention a couple of research studies which have informed policy and practice, in particular in the prison sector in Australia. And then really just give you a somewhat random potpourri of challenges and some potential solutions that we've tried to, um, to grapple with in the prison sector in Australia. So, so the, the first thing to say about prisons as an entity is that they are, I guess necessarily, a, a unique physical structure because their main role is to keep people locked away. Sadly, across both developed and developing world, they are usually overcrowded and that's, that's true even in, in well-developed countries. It's definitely true in Australia. And although, in general, there's a truism about prison, uh, prison from the society perspective, we often think of prisoners and prisons as a place where people get locked away and it's really out of sight, out of mind, and we think that they're there for a long time. Actually, in general, across the globe, prisons are short-stay uh, entities. So individuals typically transit rapidly from the prison back into society. And that's something that mainstream society often is largely unaware of or, or chooses to ignore. And in most prison systems, especially in countries where they have more than one physical structure, individuals are moved frequently. It's, a, it's a, often a, partly a necessity to access healthcare or go to the courts or whatever, but also part of an additional punishment that the system imposes on, on individual prisoners. And prison environments, again, as a generalisation, they have a couple of other features, and perhaps partly because of the nature of the individuals that are incarcerated and the, the, the physical and structured enclosed environment, they are, they're often places that are intrinsically violent. And that, that also reflects the fact that there's no purposeful activity. People are put there simply to be locked away. Rehabilitation is spoken about, but actually rarely practised in any meaningful sense. And prisons necessarily are structures that separate individuals from their family and their networks, their supportive, psychological and practical supportive structures. And so they impose a series of additional physical and psychological uh, harms and risks on, on individuals who are incarcerated. And then finally, if, if, if you might be under the impression that developing, for instance, a hepatitis service in a prison environment should be pretty straightforward, Actually, prisons, in addition to those other issues, the prisoners form a, an interesting um, subculture that's quite separate and quite different from the mainstream society. In one of the prisons where I work in New South Wales, there are five uh, physically separate wings of this high maximum security prison. And because there's so much violence between individuals in the prisons, uh, indigenous Australians are segregated in one wing, Caucasians, mostly bikies, in, the, in another wing, Southeast Asians in another wing. And so you can see that, 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 that there's, there, there are issues that would really, or at least be not well evident in mainstream society that are prominent in the prison. So what about the, the prison population across the globe? There are about 10 million individuals incarcerated across the globe at any one time with a rate of about 100 per 100,000 generally. We're up there in Australia with about double that rate, not as high as Texas, but, but we're, we're definitely up there. And the trend line in Australia in particular is of increasing duration and increasing numbers of imprisonment. Prisoners are generally male uh, predominant and there's heavy over-representation of ethnic minorities and generally poor socioeconomic status. So they're most they are the most disadvantaged members of our community. And in the prisons in New South Wales, the, the poor literacy rate is about 25%. The functionally illiterate rate is about 10%. So you can see that that immediately represents interesting challenges for health literacy and health communications for a hepatitis service. Um, 
the intersection of hepatitis C and the prison environment has about 1.5 million individuals globally. So that's about 15% of the prison population across the globe are infected. And there are countries of which Australia is one which are up there. So we've got about a 30% intersection, about 30% of our prevalent population in the Australian prisons are hepatitis C infected. And Canada and some selected European countries are similarly high on that list. In Australia, we're very lucky. We, we do actually have very good surveillance and epidemiological data that informs us of the nature of our hepatitis C infected population. We're lucky that about 80% of all Australians have been tested for hepatitis C. And so our estimates are that we have about 1% of the population infected or chronically infected. So that's about 230,000 individuals. And as Margaret flagged, the great majority of those individuals, approximately 80%, have acquired that infection through injecting drug use. And in addition, we have quite good survey data that gives us a sense of the lifetime risk of injecting and the, and the current, as in in the last 12 months injecting. And you can see illustrated in this schematic here that there are just under 200,000 individuals who have become infected, uh, who are lifetime injecting drug users, and about 60,000 in that orange central circle who have, have been injecting in the last 12 months. And they intersect with two plausibly key venues for hepatitis service delivery for an otherwise hard to access population, and they are prisons and drug and alcohol OST uh, treatment facilities. And you can see the relative numbers. So in Australia, there are about 50,000 individuals who go through the prison doors each year, and at any one time, therefore, about um, 15,000 are infected. So just to briefly introduce you to a couple of research studies because I'm going to present a touch of data from them. The first of them is a prospective cohort study called the HITS cohort, which I ran in the New South Wales prisons until pretty recently. And in that cohort, we enrolled about 600 individuals and followed them over many years, initially uninfected, and sadly, many of them became infected and became reinfected and superinfected. The second study was part of a project I was leading trying to grapple with the challenge of changing a traditional, what I would call in-reach model, where a hepatitis specialist of whatever sort goes into a prison environment um, and delivers healthcare in a, a traditional liver clinic kind of sense, into a more high throughput, efficient scale-up approach. And we chose to do that through an, a skills transfer project to educate, hepatitis skills educate some selected nurses, protocolise the whole process, triage for complex uh, care and deliver telemedicine. New South Wales, the state where I work, is about 800,000 square kilometres in size, 34 prisons, so they're scattered geographically over a vast distance. So in that model, we actually found we could deliver care pretty well across the state using this nurse-facilitated model with relatively limited specialist support and not having to move to a, to a central prison in an in a, in a urban centre was a key attribute that meant that the custodial officers and the inmates themselves and the healthcare staff, everybody was pretty happy. This is, this is in the interferon era, believe it or not, so, so much happier now in the DAA era. And then the final project is that one that Margaret flagged, which is a, one of two large treatment as prevention studies, research studies being conducted in Australia, the one that Margaret's been telling you about in the community and this one in the prisons. We're essentially in four prisons in New South Wales with a total of about 1,500 individuals. We're trying to efficiently test everybody, survey for incident infection, and we've been finding that there is indeed an ongoing incident infection, and then rapidly scale up treatment to eradicate the virus from the, the physical population and prevent transmissions. So first of all, just a touch of data from the HITS cohort, which was that incident cohort. You can see here data with incidents sitting just between 10 and 11%, actually relatively unchanged over the last decade or so of that study. So a continuing pretty high incident case rate. And this contrasts somewhat with the community where the rate has been slowly declining in Australia, the incident case rate. 
And if we look at the factors that were associated with incident infection in this cohort, um, what you can see is actually that the, the, the risk factors you might expect to be associated with incident infection are indeed associated, injecting and sharing and so on. The, the noteworthy items are that there was a positive association with receipt of OST, so individuals who are on OST therapy actually had a higher rate of incident infection. And the only other prevention strategy available in the prison system is bleach cleansing or uh, it's a disinfectant actually, cleansing of the injecting apparatus which is made freely available. And that, neither of those provided any protective efficacy. In a sister cohort to the HITS cohort in the community in Sydney, Lisa Maher has shown that OST is indeed pr protective. So that means that the prison environment's got some extra challenges in a, in a prevention strategic approach. And the independent association was really with frequency <laughs> of injecting. <coughs> okay, so now moving just a little bit of a discussion about some of the challenges and some of the potential solutions. I've, I've really here just um, flagged some of the things that come from my experience in working in this sector for quite a while. One of the things that's often a problem is that um, in some prison sectors, and the one where I work is an example of this, there is what I'd call a separation of the powers. That is, is not the, the state and the church or the legisla legis legislature, it's actually the custodial authority and the health authority. My experience has been that healthcare provision through a custodial employer of the healthcare providers sets up an intrinsic conflict of interest that's hard to ungrapple. And so separation of a health authority from the custodial authority is, is one that I would advocate for. And then in healthcare uh, uh, payments, we've already heard a little bit about some of the challenges from the US and elsewhere about uh, payment. You can picture that in the community in general, uh, prisoners rank pretty lowly in the priority list of who should get prioritised for an expensive treatment. And so it's not a surprise, therefore, that government-based uh, payment of health care for, for, for prisoners is, is a, a system that I would advocate for. Another circumstance that's often challenging in the, in the prison sector across the globe, and true in some states in Australia, is that prisons sometimes have their health care provided by local health authorities. So the neighbouring hospital provides what I'd call an in-reach service into the prison. In that sort of context, there's often a prioritisation, or you might say a deprioritisation, so that the inmates get the lower priority of health care in comparison to the priority of community-based individuals who could, could or should uh, deserve equitable care. So we're best off trying to avoid circumstances where there's uh, an opportunity to deprioritise prisoners. In the health workforce sense, another key issue is that um, there, there is a capacity issue. Prison systems, prison healthcare systems vary widely. And this is true in Australia as well, where in some uh, prison systems there are general practitioners employed by the health service of, what, of whatever ilk, and in others um, there are no such provision. It's really nurses doing the great majority of care. In the state where I work, Plenty of those prisons that I mentioned, they're so far away that really it's an occasional visit from a local general practitioner based in the community that provides the only medical level health care. So access to specialist uh, physicians or even medical practitioners is quite variable. And that's similarly reflected by the hepatitis skills. So, so that, that's a constraint in capacity. What about at the provider level, some of the challenges are? So uh, in a lot of venues, um, inmates are taken from a prison to the local outpatient department of the hospital, and they generally travel in manacles with guards, um, which is quite a cost to the custodial authority, and generally doesn't win many friends in the outpatients department where they're in prison garb and they're wearing manacles and they're intimidating for the, for the community. So, so that sort of out, prisoners going out is a model which we should generally disencourage. And really, we should be encouraging in-reach services, as in take the clinicians into the prison or, or have them based inside the health service inside the prison. 
And in general, it's a truism that across most systems, nurses are, in the prison sector are often more readily available. And we've heard already in some circumstances where nurse-led models of care have been well established. And so that's an opportunity we've taken up in New South Wales. Movements are flagged as an issue, and movements not only between prisons, but between the prisons and the community. So getting continuity of care into the community is challenging. Short length of stay. In the state where I work, the median length of stay is just under five months. So it's just enough to get a diagnosis and a treatment completed if we're efficient about detection and uh, initiation of treatment. And prisoners in general have really high rates of comorbidities, not just um, substance uh, abuse, but also uh, high, high rates of current and lifetime um, mental health illnesses, particularly uh, depression and psychosis. Okay, at the level of the in individuals, there are some uh, additional things to, to, to be faced. So generally, uh, in Australia at least, the prison population actually is very aware about hepatitis C because one in three individuals in the prison has it. In, so in some ways, it's lack of awareness about the opportunities for treatment that they're unaware of. So the challenge in education is really just letting them know we can treat and we can cure. There is indeed a surprising level of stigma still associated amongst prisoners or between prisoners with the idea of coming forward and getting treated. And that is partly a reflection that if they come forward and get treated, they get targeted by the custodial officers as being ongoing injecting drug users. And that, may, that they might may not have disclosed or might not have been aware. And some populations within the prison, like Indigenous Australians, have special cultural issues. So in, in general, Indigenous Australians in prison in Australia would prefer to get diagnosed and treated and cured before they get back out to their wider community because having hep C is, is kind of unclean and is a, is a stigmatising uh, issue in their community. Even in the healthcare providers, I'm shocked in many ways by the lack of awareness of the efficaciousness of, of hepatitis C treatment. And so uh, amongst the non-skilled healthcare workers, as in the hepatitis non-skilled, there are some challenges. And even the custodial staff. So when I talk to the custodial staff about the merits of hepatitis C treatment, they don't really want to know about anything that's being given special to inmates. All they would care about, the, the, the pitch that I give anyway, is really that this is an opportunity to clean the environment where they work, reduce the risk that when they have a needle stick in that environment where they're doing a search of a prison cell, they won't get infected and they won't go home and infect the missus, infect their partner or wife. So, so what's to be done about these issues? Well, I've already flagged that I like the separation of the powers, that is health service separated from custodial authority, and I like prison-based services as, as a strategic approach. Um, predictably, I guess, coming from Australia, I like the idea of universal access to testing and treatment in the prisons, and that often is a special layer of addition on top of the community level, and the health workforce needing skills-based training. One of the things that we've done in the New South Wales system to facilitate the latter is to develop a nursing uh, uh, hepatitis C specific education and skills based training program, really in a kind of an apprenticeship model so that I can be confident that the nurses who are working with me in the prison sector can reliably assess and treat and manage and identify problems in the inmates that are at least broadly under my care, of which there are several hundred at any one time. <clears throat> one of the other solutions going up to at the organisational level has been flagged, I think, already by Margaret. We've been lucky in Australia that we've had national strategies running for a decade. And one of the things that's um, special in those strategies, which was argued and lobbied strongly for, was that prisoners should be a priority population for treatment if we're going to achieve our elimination targets. And so we were very lucky with that uh, announcement for the funding program that, that uh, Margaret already alluded to, that the health minister acknowledged that and made a specific arrangement uh, administrative arrangement to ensure that prisoners could indeed be made uh, have access to the, the DAA therapies. 
So what about uh, some solutions to, to sort out the issues in the providers? Well, one of the things we've been doing quite recently is evaluating the efficiencies of this nurse-led model of care that I've flagged to you, comparing data from the DAA era to the previous data from the interferon era. And what we've found in a kind of a time and motion study is that at the moment it takes about 75 minutes on average of a nurse's time from our at the, top, the point of testing through to the point of designation of SBR, SVR for one individual. And that used to average approximately two to three times that in the interferon era. The specialist time, I used to see people mostly face to face um, and spend a lot of time thinking about what was wrong with them, all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, really, all I do is write the script. So it's approximately five minutes per patient only. And the timelines from the beginning of post-test counselling for the diagnosis through to initiation of treatment used to be about six months, despite our best efforts to get things efficient, definitely now down to about 12 weeks. And the, the throughput, that's the number of individuals who are identified as having chronic hep C, who we say, would you like to go on to treatment? 95% will say yes, please, and, and indeed do so. And we're currently scaling up from an average which used to be about... Um, five to ten per month in the prison system where I work, up to 60 a month, and we're heading for 100 a month over the next couple of months. So scale-up is definitely plausible. And then the last thing I want to flag on, the, on the, the individual level of challenges and solutions is really about education. One of the things I flagged at earlier on was about the relatively low literacy of the prison population. So low literacy, prison-oriented educational materials, absolutely a high priority. So stuff that talks in, uh, that has individuals illustrated in non-prison garb or looking uh, like they live in the community and not in the prison just doesn't cut the muster. So education has to be targeted, prison-oriented in, in, in approach. And I want to acknowledge a lot of my co-investigators. Thank you very much. <laughs>